Yesterday, we heard the stories of two lovely women, one who was recently just celebrated a year of being cancer free and the other who has been diagnosed with breast cancer since the pandemic. Today, we will welcome Dr. Jessica Trevino Jones, an award-winning researcher, professor, and breast oncologist with a special interest in overcoming resistance and hormone-positive breast cancer. She is here to share her presentation on breast cancer and to answer a few questions. Welcome, Dr. Trevino Jones. Thank you so much, Ms. Crosby. I'd like to share this presentation that I made for you and your church to share who is high risk for breast cancer and what can we do to address these things. So this October, we're celebrating Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Again, my name is Dr. Jessica Trevino Jones. I am a breast and sarcoma oncologist, as well as our breast cancer prevention leader. So it's alarming the day and age that we now live, that COVID can even happen, that our world can turn upside down. All the things, all the issues, all the problems that already existed before COVID are being compounded. I think we can all agree we feel this every day. Cancer is no different and cancer prevention is still necessary. But unfortunately, mammograms have been down by 86% during COVID. In the beginning, this was necessary because we were trying to figure out how to be safe. But just the numbers alone from April to June, the prediction is that 40,000 women have had missed or now delayed diagnoses of breast cancer. But COVID won't stop us from preventing breast cancer, which is why I thank you guys again today for letting me speak about it. Breast cancer screening is important because it's the most common cancer that we have with one in eight women being diagnosed with it. Just by being a woman, we have a risk of developing breast cancer, which is why women should start screening whenever they're in their 40s. And when we catch breast cancer early, we have a cure rate of 98%. Medical societies right now are trying to address the need that has developed since COVID started. The need that we know now that these women are walking around with undiagnosed cancer. We are asking all high-risk women to get to the scanner first. But who's high risk? Have we even talked about this before? I don't think a lot of us know. And that's because it's really been knowledge that we haven't had to share until recently. But I wanna talk about it today. So the breakdown for risk of women in general for breast cancer, there is a big link to family history. We don't understand all the genes connected with breast cancer, but just having a family history of breast cancer is important and contributes to 15 to 20% of breast cancer cases. We have been able to identify the genes related to some breast cancer, which is why five to 10% are considered hereditary. But this is quickly evolving because we're learning more about genes. So what we call sporadic of breast cancer occurs about 70 to 80% of the time. And out of this group, you can't change your genetics. We understand that, but there are ways that we can navigate the risk. In this group of women, 66% of women, if they know that they're high risk, if they are told that, we have ways to prevent them from getting breast cancer. So who's high risk? The normal risk of breast cancer is 12.8%. And that just exists because we're women and we have estrogen and we have breast. But if you've been told that you have had an irregular mammogram more than once, multiple six month follow-ups, you may be at high risk. If you've ever been told that your breasts are very dense, if you started puberty before your friends, or if you've, if you've had menopause, if you started menopause later than all of your friends, any hormone replacement after menopause puts you at higher risk of breast cancer. This is an important one that lots of people don't know about, but any breast biopsy, even if it wasn't cancer, puts you at higher risk. So even though you got the, okay, this is something we can look at, you have options and opportunities to decrease the risk that you have. Obesity after menopause is a risk factor, as well as alcohol, which has been independently linked if women drink more than six glasses of wine a week. I bet after listening to this list, you've probably been able to identify someone who's high risk. It might be yourself. It might be your mom. It might be your aunts or your best friends. Knowing is part of the battle. 
the risk for breast cancer is multifactorial, but every woman can get a personalized risk assessment if we take into account her personal breast history, her family history, and her diet and weight. I want to give you an example of how I do an assessment as a breast oncologist. This is a 45 year old woman and she's been getting mammograms since she was 40 because that's what she was told to do. But in her thirties, she noted that she had some lumpy breast and she would tell her doctor and they would send her to go get an ultrasound. She actually had a biopsy when she was 42 and it was negative. She's been told that her breasts are very dense. She's really jealous of all of her friends because they never get a call back. They get to see their mammogram every year versus her where she never knows if she's going to be told come back in six months. Doing a personalized risk assessment, looking at these other risk factors, how old was she when she started her puberty, her height and her weight. She's just a little bit overweight for her height. She went and she got her education and she went to graduate school and she didn't have children till she was done getting her degree. And so her first child was at the age of 32. She's not yet had menopause, but she is taking contraception right now because she really doesn't want a baby when she's 45. And she's been told that her aunt um, on her dad's side had breast cancer, but not to worry about it because that's her dad's side. Her risk of breast cancer isn't 12% her risk is actually 22 to 25%. She's only been getting mammograms. She qualifies for yearly MRIs and medications. Thankfully, she doesn't need genetic testing. If any of us were told you have a 25% chance of winning the lottery, you would probably buy a ticket. Not that I'm saying that people should go and buy lottery tickets, but 25% for a woman and her health that's entirely too high, especially when the national average is 12. African-American women are particularly at risk for breast cancer and adverse events. Did you know that an African-American woman is more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer at a later stage? This is in comparison to Caucasian or Asian women, the exact same age and the exact same socioeconomic status. There was a study in Chicago that revealed lots of systemic issues surrounding this medical emergency and the medical community at large still doesn't know how to bridge this gap. African American women, if they get diagnosed with breast cancer are more likely to have an aggressive breast cancer. This is independent of being staged at a later stage and African American women are more likely to die from their breast cancer. And we still haven't been able to identify the reason why or a solution for it. But I'm here to tell you that that's one of my active research risks, what we are presently trying to fight by identifying women at high risk. We believe that if an African-American woman who knows, we know she's at high risk, we know that there's a chance that she could get breast cancer. If we help her early, we can bridge that gap. Let's fight the odds for all of our women. Mammograms in medicine are important because the previous patient that I mentioned with a 25 to 22% chance of getting cancer, there's an opportunity for her to take a medicine. If she takes that pill for five years, we can decrease her risk by 50% and her new risk is 11 to 13. That means our 45 year old patient, when she's 55, when she's 65, when she's 75, when she's watching her grandkids go across the stage in her eighties, she will be safe. And if she does, heaven forbid, get breast cancer, the screening is our great equalizer. If we increase her mammograms and add MRIs, we will increase her chance of detecting cancer. And if we do that every year, and if she qualifies for MRIs and we get those every year, we can increase the cure rate, which is at 98%, 98% of the time. So, Genetics can be caught in real time as well. And I'm going to quickly go over this because I don't want to take too much of your time. But this is a true story from a nurse that was referred to my clinic who wants to share her story. She's 38 and she waited until she had a baby. She waited till she was finished with nursing school. She got a job. She got married a little bit later in life. And her first baby was when she was 38. But the surgeon who knew me and knew what I do referred her to me because the surgeon looked at her breast history and thought to herself, this woman is at risk of breast cancer. Because the patient then shared with me, 
She had had three biopsies over the short course of her life. She was only 38. She's never had cancer, but she started her mammograms even in her 30s. She, after her second biopsy, was told that her breasts just looked different. And as it turned out, when I was able to review her imaging, she had dense breasts. She had two aunts with breast cancer on both her mom's side and her dad's side. And when her mom was diagnosed the month before, that's why she had gotten that a lump checked out, even though the lump wasn't cancer. But she did qualify for genetic testing and genetics is evolving very quickly. And we were able to identify this unique gene that I'm listing here called RAD50. It's not BRCA, but it's just as dangerous as BRCA. And it takes the skill of physicians who specialize in breasts to be able to tell you that and provide care. So this patient was able to get genetic counselor support, surgery, radiology, and oncology. And not only are we gonna take care of her, but we can take care of her daughter. It's so important to take care of our children. So give me the information, how do I screen mammograms? So I am a UT physician and UT is affiliated both with Memorial Hermann and with MD Anderson. So I want to give you guys information on where to get mammograms at both locations. So Memorial Hermann has, you can see here, just a ton of blue dots all over your community. MD Anderson also has four locations that you can go get mammograms. Both Memorial Hermann and MD Anderson, they use dedicated breast radiologists. So that way you know for sure that your mammogram is going to be read by someone who has been trained to do this. So, oops, um, let me clear this up. I was interested to see how close the nearest mammogram suite was to you guys. And it turns out it's 12 minutes away from your church. So wow. there are phone numbers that you can call and websites that you can go to. The website that I'm listing here is Memorial Hermann's website, which is where we find the breast care centers. The number is listed at any of these locations, but there's this really nifty tool called a schedule now. And when you click it, it gives you the opportunity to pick your own time and everything so you don't have to talk to anyone if you don't want to. MD Anderson has a phone number, which I listed here at the bottom of the screen for you to call and make your appointments. I don't believe they have anything online. So that's why I've listed this here for you. If you think you're at high risk, Memorial Hermann has opened up its first ever breast cancer prevention clinic, which is what I'm the leader of, where I work with two nurse navigators. Not trying to say, come to me. I don't want to, don't, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do, but just know that you have services available to you. And previously women didn't have it. It just didn't exist in Houston. But COVID and cancer have met its match. And so I thank everyone at the Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church for letting me take their time for this presentation. Thanks. Wow, thank you so much. This was absolutely amazing. I learned some things that I had no clue about. Um, so I do have a few questions for you um, and for the people who may be watching who um, have these questions as well. Growing up, many of us, you know, we're led to believe that breast cancer is only an issue for those who are over 40. Um, and you mentioned that it is important to start paying attention to those signs earlier in life. So if a woman has a history of breast cancer in her family, should she begin to get, how soon should she um, begin to get checked? If a woman has a family history of breast cancer, her age for mammograms should still be 30 with the, I mean, 40, excuse me, with the exception of, did she have any of those risk factors that I mentioned? If you do have those risk factors and you have a family history, you do qualify for early screening. And I have my, um, my patient who is actually 30, who was in the Houston Chronicle, if I may step away from the screen for one uh -huh. second. My patient, Chelsea, who you can see here, she doesn't have a family history. She is only 30 and she noticed an irregular mass in her breast and she went to go get it checked out. So what I urge all women is there's no rule for if you notice something wrong, something's wrong, go, go. Your life is worth so much more. It's better to be safe than sorry. Thank you. And when you say family history, does that just mean immediate family or grandparents or can that be cousins or like when should we be worried? 
That's a really good question. The most immediate risk falls if your mother or your sisters or any of your aunts have had breast cancer. If it's been your grandmother and none of your aunts or mother have breast cancer, it's less of a risk, but it's still there. So if there's any breast abnormalities that you've noticed, even if it was your grandmother who had cancer and not your mom or aunts, you should still take any breast change seriously. And we hear about checking under the armpit as well. What should we feel for and where exactly? Is it directly under, is it closer to the breast? Where exactly should we be checking when we're doing our self-examinations? Thank you, that's another excellent question. Breast examinations are being, there are different medical societies right now that are trying to tell women, maybe you don't do your own breast exams because maybe you don't know the, the way your breast feels. So what we've shifted to start saying is, do exams on your breast and in your armpit all the way through deep in as well as around and this part of your breast. So you can get to know how your breast feels. That way, if something changes or something's abnormal, you'll be able to tell yourself, hmm, this is not how my breasts usually feel. This is not normal. But in regards to feeling your armpit, it is all the way through around and in. Wow, okay. Um, so we hear a lot about the women, um, but people tend to forget that this affects men as well. If a man has a history of breast cancer in his family, should he be just as concerned as a woman and what are his chances of being diagnosed? Men are still susceptible to breast cancer. And we know that because the BRCA gene has showed us that men can have a risk when they have this gene. If there's any man who has a family history of BRCA, if they have all their aunts, all their, their own mother, everyone seems to have breast cancer, they one, they qualify for genetic testing, even though they're a man. And two, they should take any lump on their breast seriously because they are at tremendous risk. There is sporadic, spontaneous forms of breast cancer that can affect men. Predisposing risk factors include what we call gynecomastia or men who have more breast tissue. If any man notices a lump on his breast, he should take it seriously and not dismiss it because there is no such thing as a normal lump on a man's breast. Great, great. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we heard from two women, one who has dealt with it and one who's currently dealing with the cancer. Um, one, of the, one of the women who, the woman who is currently dealing with breast cancer, she mentioned she's had a very active life. She's vegan. Um, she's tried to live, maintain a healthy lifestyle her whole life. So you know, is there anything else that she could have done? What about those people who do maintain healthy lifestyles and they think that, you know, I'm, I'm at less of a risk? What would you tell them? I would tell them that I'm so proud of you for doing that healthy lifestyle. It is meaningful. It is important. And sometimes genetics play a role in breast cancer that you could not have prevented. And you shouldn't beat yourself up about that. And you shouldn't feel bad or think that your lifestyle failed you. It didn't. There's so much we're still learning about breast cancer. And I would encourage all women to still live that way if they can, because there's so many other parts of our life that we can protect other than our breast, including our heart and our lungs and our brain, because we mean so much to so many people. We do deserve to take care of ourselves. Now, I would encourage all women to maintain a healthy weight if they can, but I know that it is challenging, especially if obesity is genetic in your family. So for that, I want to mention to you that there have been some non-pharmacologic ways that have reduced women's risk of getting breast cancer. That includes prolonged nightly fasting, which is similar to intermittent fasting. That has had a decreased risk of breast cancer. Green tea, if taken daily, has also been shown to reduce a woman's risk of breast cancer. Awesome. And finally, you mentioned the risk-reducing medications. What are those and do we have direct access to that? So you touch on a question that brings up a tremendously controversial area in medicine. The medicine is called tamoxifen. And the FDA has recently proved another medicine called anastrozole. 
the medicine can be given by a primary care doctor or, or an OB doctor, but truly these doctors aren't trained to give it. And that's because it's not part of their certification. It's not part of their training. It's part of a cancer doctor's training. It's part of a cancer surgeon's training. So how does a oncologist, how does a breast surgeon, how do they take care of non-cancer patients if they're the ones with the knowledge? Who takes care of this big space of women that deserve care? That's why the clinic I just showed you guys is so, so incredibly impressive. It's because it's addressing that gap of care because honestly, oncologists are really the only ones who can prescribe it and handle the side effects. And before there'd never been a space for women who are high risk. My clinic does that. And which is why your, um, why the other physicians have mentioned that they wanted me to give your talk today. So I thank you for the opportunity because high risk women, we are out there. You deserve extra care and there are services for you. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much um, for your time. This was absolutely amazing. If you're watching, please take everything that Dr. Trevino Jones shared with us today and take it seriously and make sure that you take advantage of the information that we shared today. So thank you so much once again. Um, this was amazing. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time.